I am doing a little bit of a different video this time because we're a little bit pressed for time, but there is a pressing kind of news story going on in the veterinary and dog world. And that is this mystery respiratory illness that many news outlets have reported, as I'm sure you've seen many social media veterinarians are talking about too. So I wanted to get a video out this week to talk about this, and I don't have a chance to sit in my basement and be a typical basement troll like I normally am. So I had to uh, go to my actual office here. I grabbed one of the critical care residents to come talk to me and come talk to you because this is the type of doctor who would deal with these respiratory cases the most, a criticalist. So this is Dr. Cook. Uh, she is an emergency and critical care resident where we both work. She's great. Yep. <laughs> and we're going to talk about this mystery respiratory disease. Let's start by saying what is a typical kennel cough presentation, because this is what initially people thought it was, and then it turned out to be more severe. But I think it's good to start with what is the usual mild kennel cough case that you see through the ER? What, what does that typically present like? Yeah, so the mild kennel cough case um, that you'll see is normally a hacking cough, kind of like your dog is trying to clear their throat. Sometimes that'll be accompanied by what people may think is vomiting, but is more just coughing up some clear foam or phlegm. But other than really a, a loud hacking cough and some phlegm, they should be acting totally normal, still eating and drinking, still wanting to play and being their normal self. So it's like a common cold for a dog. Like, exactly. You know, okay. When did you guys start noticing that there was like a different presentation of these respiratory cases coming in? About a year ago is when we first started seeing these cases that we originally thought was, was just kennel cough. We weren't super worried about it. And then we would, you know, take chest x-rays because maybe the dog wasn't eating, wasn't wanting to play. We were concerned there was something else going on and we found this pneumonia or, or worsening respiratory disease that that we were seeing was making these dogs actually not feel good for once. Okay. Since then, it's been kind of slowly uncovered that you run all the typical diagnostics that you would for these cases of kennel cough and pneumonia, and you're just not finding anything. Whereas previously, you, you would more commonly find like an agent. Is that how it works? Like the diagnostics would yield something? Yeah, so I think it depends on the person. I was a general practitioner before I went into specialty and residency. And, and so, you know, definitely kennel cough used to be what I would call like a chill disease. We didn't really treat it. We didn't really run a lot of diagnostics. You would just run the course just like if you and I had a normal cold. Now we are, yeah, absolutely working it up. And so there's something called a respiratory PCR that veterinarians may recommend, which is basically just like a COVID test. You swab the nose, swab the eyes, swab, swab the mouth. And that tests for pretty common viruses or bacteria that may cause an upper respiratory disease. I never used to take chest x-rays, honestly, in these kennel cough dogs. Now I definitely am because we're finding more pneumonia. And then sometimes we'll even do something called a trach wash, which is where we put fluid into their lungs to try and get some cells in there. But yeah, all these tests are coming back negative, which okay. is scary. So the main diagnostics, there's three of them. There's a chest x-ray to look for pneumonia. Mm -hmm. There's a blood test that is a PCR panel against all the different infectious diseases. Nasal swab. Oh, sorry, blood. sorry, yeah. nasal swab mm -hmm. for a PCR panel. And then there is a trach wash. Mm -hmm. And briefly explain what a trach wash is again as the third major when, test. Yep. Yeah, so you're going to intubate the patient like they're getting surgery. And then you're going to put sterile fluid, normally sterile saline, down. And so it goes through the trach tube into their lungs. Okay. Then we give them a little bit of a cough or make them cough and suck it back up. And you'll get the best cells. You know, you'll get lung tissue cells, any bacteria that's down there. Okay. So this is like a direct sample of the airway. Exactly. So, if you, so it's the best way. Is that the most sensitive? thing to do like testing wise yeah i would call okay. that the most yeah gold standard for diagnosing okay. any sort of airway disease okay and so you said typically these kennel cough cases they come in with like a, a cough that was not they didn't show signs of systemic illness and one of these tests would typically or historically show up positive and tell you something it sounds like the story now is just that we're seeing more cases of more severe pneumonia and systemic illness and life-threatening respiratory disease that is also negative on all three of these tests and this is happening more frequently than you have seen historically in your career. Yeah, I mean, I would say so that the pneumonia, the chest x-rays are probably going to show pneumonia. Sometimes they don't, but for the really sick dogs, those will show pneumonia. And just real quick, for, for those of you who don't know, pneumonia isn't specific to one infection, like different types of infections, bacteria and viruses and fungus and whatnot. They can cause pneumonia. So just finding pneumonia on an x-ray doesn't tell you what is the actual infectious disease. And that's kind of part of the struggle here. Mm -hmm. But go ahead. A normal kennel cough dog would come in 
maybe three years ago. I would offer chest x-rays, but I would tell owners, you know, the chances of your dog developing pneumonia secondary to kennel cough are, are pretty low. Right. Now we are finding pneumonia secondary to this disease much more commonly, okay. which is the first scary part yeah. because it's that's definitely changed right. in these cases that we used to not even really recommend treatment for. The conversation you're having with an owner is different right off the bat because we have to factor in the fact that it could go from what looks mild now and sometime in the near future, this could turn and get much worse and life-threatening. Exactly. And what's the duration of time between when a dog would present with their initial, what looks like standard kennel cough, and then how much time passes until they start to show more severe signs in these mystery illness cases? Yeah, so I mean, I guess I can only talk for this hospital, obviously, but I find that what we're seeing is these dogs have signs maybe two, four, five weeks ago of kennel cough. Okay. And then maybe they get treated, maybe they don't, and then they kind of just wax and wane in their signs and until weeks later they come in because they're not eating, they have a fever, they're having trouble breathing. Right. So it is taking a couple of weeks for them to really declare themselves, at least in what we're seeing here. Okay, and do they get normal in between, like completely, or do they tend to have like a lingering cough and lingering kind of not doing normally? They tend to have a lingering cough. Okay, yeah. and so currently, because nothing is coming up in any diagnostic test that we run, we have no idea what this is. Yeah, right? so we're, we're working with um, a lab in uh, New Hampshire that is trying to run their own special special PCR to figure out what it is, which okay. is basically just looking at the DNA of, of whatever the infection is. Right. But yeah, when we send out just the common respiratory PCRs, sometimes we'll get something called mycoplasma, which is a commensal organism. So it's normally a secondary infection if your dog is already sick. Right. But other than that, we're not getting a slam dunk of every single case that has pneumonia or is really sick has like this disease. Right. We're not getting anything like that. So sometimes we'll get mycoplasma, but you don't know if that's just secondary to a viral mm -hmm. infection because it's just like a sinus infection or something. You right. Virus, and then you get bacteria on top of it. Yeah. The biggest thing for a dog owner to know would be the signs to watch for a dog owner for that their dog might develop this respiratory issue. The first is a cough, that being the initial kind of phase of things. Mm -hmm. And then when things get more serious, how does a dog typically look at home so that people know what to recognize? Yeah, so they'll probably still have a cough, nasal discharge, a lot of eye discharge, especially if it's green or um, like mucusy, not just a clear discharge. They're lethargic, they're not wanting to eat, they're not wanting to act themselves, um, are gonna be kind of the signs that we're starting to get more sick than just your usual kennel cough. Okay, what is your initial treatment modality for these cases where you've done all the testing, it's all negative, but they're getting worse, mm -hmm. they represent to you again. What is your therapy of choice in those cases? Yeah, so unfortunately by the time they get to me, they're normally oxygen dependent. Because you're a criticalist, so. Yeah, because <laughs> right? I'm seeing yeah. the, I'm a critical care resident, yeah, so right. I'm seeing the sickest cases in the hospital most yes. of the time, but they have pretty severe pneumonia affecting all of their lung lobes. They're oxygen dependent, so definitely admitting them to the hospital, getting them on oxygen supplementation. We're also not really finding an antibiotic, a specific one that's working for all of these dogs. Really? So we normally do broad spectrum, which is going to be probably unison and Batril at the same time okay. to try and get on top of these dogs because unfortunately it can just continue to develop into a case where that may they may have to go on a ventilator because their lungs are so affected. Yeah, and if they go on a ventilator, what are the odds that they get off the ventilator and go home at that point? Very low, Yeah, like a person. The AVMA recently released some guidelines to say like, try to prevent this by keeping your dog vaccinated, which to me, if we don't know what this is and the vaccines are for things that we test for and know what they are, anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't know what if that does any good. I think it's just a safeguard mm -hmm. more than anything else. I mean, I'm not anti-vax or anything. Yeah. I'm just saying... <laughs> <laughs> I think that we at least, if we cover them with the kennel cough vaccine or the Bordetella vaccine, yeah. which is the one that the veter your veterinarian will give through the nose a lot of the time, we're at least giving them some sort of protection, just like the flu vaccine, to right. at least have something to protect from whatever we don't know this is. Because we don't know, is this a secondary organism that does right. infect them two or three weeks later? Right. So I think definitely keeping them vaccinated, keeping them on top of vaccines. Where I used to work in, in Texas, we would actually vaccinate for Bordetella every six months okay. because we just had more dogs in the city okay. probably than we do out here in Rhode Island or at least out in South County okay. versus the city. Keeping your dogs away from dog parks, that avoiding makes... boarding and yeah. day play. Because it's a respiratory disease so it's going to be transmitted where dogs all congregate. I don't know about you, I am of the opinion, that does not represent the company that I work for, but I am of the opinion that I'm never taking my dog to a dog park or, or like a boarding facility if I can avoid it. Yeah. Just for this reason. Right? I this always is... used to say that dog parks and day play just produce bad behavior and bad illness. Yeah. So I also don't like my dogs to go to those places. That's what it seems like. Where we work, we offer a holistic ventilator. Are you aware? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
If you're coming into a multidiscipline ER specialty center and your dog's looking at a ventilator, how how much is that like a per day sort of thing? Uh, cost-wise to estimate. Yeah, so I mean, I think people definitely forget that the ventilators that we use in veterinary medicine are the ventilators that are used in human medicine. Right. We use the same drugs. We have to understand the same things that, that human doctors do. So it does come at a cost, unfortunately. I would say probably about four to five thousand dollars a day or yeah. at least to start up and then yeah. about one to two thousand dollars long term right myself and my resident mates have to be here the whole time an animal is on a ventilator so right. there's doctors in the building 24 7 just sitting with the ventilator not touching any other patients but the other issue with this disease is because it's infectious and we only have one ventilator right. that shares air you know with whatever the patient is on it right. it's actually not indicated to ventilate these dogs because right. we could infect healthy dogs it if they ever go on the ventilator. contaminate the machine exactly yeah. Oh man, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. So in stage with these dogs, when they get to that point, like what do you do? Is, is it just a terminal illness at this point, as far as we know? There are other things. At our hospital, we don't have something called high flow oxygen, uh -huh. which is a way to provide even higher amounts of oxygen without having to intubate them and put them on a ventilator. Okay. So you can try that for refractory cases. Okay. But a lot of the times, you know, unfortunately finances do come into to play anyways. And yeah. so, you know, so the dog isn't suffering anymore a lot of the time human euthanasia is elected. Yeah. Are there cases that you've seen where there was like a delay in getting to a criticalist or like if they had come into you earlier, things might've been better? Or does that seem to not matter because we don't know what this is and how to treat it? Yeah, I don't think it matters. Okay. I think, you know, they're in the hospital. There's always a criticalist on call. Our ER doctors are, are very experienced and I, it's, it's really hard to say which dogs do well because I mean, I also have seen dogs get antibiotics, right. leave the hospital. We've called them two or three weeks afterwards and the dog's doing well. Good. And it's hard to say those ones that just continue to decline and decline and decline and decline until they have to be intubated. And if you could tell like a primary care vet, what are some things that they could see in the patient or be be told by their owner that would trigger, hey, you probably need to get into like a more advanced level of care? What are some things that, that they should, should know about? Definitely trouble breathing, okay. um, the fast respiratory rate at home or more, even just having more effort, not wanting to eat. They're really lethargic. I mean, even yeah, when I was at GP, if I had these kennel cough dogs that weren't 100% normal except for a cough, I was concerned that there was right. something else going on. If an owner is watching their dog breathe at home, what is like a normal respiratory rate that they can kind of look for and kind of time per minute? Yeah, so normally 40 to 50 respiratory or breaths per minute. What you can do is you can time that over 10 seconds and then times it by six to get 60 seconds. Math. <laughs> Make sure you're doing it when they're sleeping, when they're resting, not right after, you know, the mailman's come or they've been playing with their other dogs to so make sure they're sleeping. If you're starting to see trends over 50 and you're con that's when I would be concerned and would be contacting a veterinarian. And I think most people are wondering like is it in fact is it transmissible to people? Yeah, you know, there's no reason to think that is the case currently. Yeah. That's oftentimes a super rare thing in general. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if we would have seen cases of like the pet owners getting sick alongside the dog, it would have happened by now right. and the, the CDC would have been reporting this. And people have definitely asked me like, "Oh, well, I had COVID, you know, a month ago. Is yeah. this related?" We're not seeing any of that. And they test for COVID. COVID, on all these cases and nobody's found a COVID positive. We're not testing on all of the cases okay. because it's very expensive and we just don't see transmission to dogs. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cook, yeah, for coming you. on the show. I guess it's a show. <laughs> all right, guys. So if you like this, please uh, like and subscribe and leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. If you're a vet, you've had any experiences with these types of cases, feel free to drop a comment below. Again, thank you, Dr. Cook. Appreciate it. Have a great holiday, everybody. Thanks. Bye.